Hello, thanks for coming. This is our uh, Weave online user group. My name is Tomo Nakahara. Uh, I run the developer experience team here at uh, WeaveWorks, and we are fortunate to here to have um, Brian Borum, who is a director of engineering at WeaveWorks as well. He's in London, I'm based in San Francisco. Uh, and today we'll have a talk on automating Kubernetes with GitOps. So hopefully you are here for this reason. Uh, I'll give a little bit of background and then we'll go right into the talk um, after a little bit of housekeeping. So thanks for your patience. We advance my slide. Oh yes. So uh, our company is called Weave Works. Weave dot Works, as I mentioned. Uh, we're a startup based in London, San Francisco, New York, Berlin, and some distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, uh, I mentioned that because our CEO, CTO, and some of our engineers come from that background. So they're the people who created RabbitMQ, and then the company and sold that to VMware, and then they saw certain needs in the container space and uh, started working on certain projects that led to the creation of this startup called WeaveWorks. Uh, we're funded by a couple of VCs, uh, like Excel Partners uh, and others. One of them is Google Google Ventures, which I bring up uh, as you'll see, because our involvement in the Kubernetes space is uh, very important to us. And so being part of the Google family also becomes part of that. Uh, as I mentioned, we started with some open source projects. Um, here are just a few, uh, but we've got more. Uh, WeaveNet was probably our earliest and what we're known mostly for. Uh, it helps you network your Kubernetes clusters and is definitely one of the premier technologies that is still out there. Uh, Brian is deeply involved with that. Uh, then we also have Cortex, which is in the CNCF, which um, helps you extend uh, and uh, scale your uh, use of Prometheus. Uh, Flux, which just joined uh, the CNCF as a stand sandbox project, uh, does GitOps for Kubernetes or um, does automated deployments and, and helps with that. And uh, Weave Scope is also one of our longer projects as well, and that gives you nice observability uh, for your clusters. One of our latest uh, projects is Weave Flagger from uh, one of the members, Stefan Prada, on our developer experience team. Um, if you've been here before, maybe you've seen him. Uh, and that brings, extends progressive delivery to your service meshes. And so um, if you're interested in any of those, you can come talk to us. Of course, we are also a company uh, with products and uh, our main product that we started with is called Weave Cloud. Uh, it's a SaaS product that helps you manage your Kubernetes clusters and it brings in a lot of the technologies and brings them together um, that I mentioned, uh, the Cortex, Scope and Flux primarily. Uh, it brings them together, it offers it as a service and connects them together. So for example, you can use Prometheus metrics to do um, schedule automated deployments. And then furthermore, we actually have extended some POCs around the progressive delivery as well. Weave Cloud has been running on Kubernetes on AWS for four years now. So we also have experience running Kubernetes in production for four years, which is quite unique. Uh, and to build that, um, you know, we kind of created our layer and now we're in the process of productizing that and we'll be calling it Weave Kubernetes Platform. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that, um, that should be out pretty soon. And it's a GitOps aware um, enterprise platform for running Kubernetes. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have four years of running Kubernetes in production. So some people need different help to get started on their journey. So we do offer some consulting training and support as part of getting started with uh, Weave Kubernetes platform, or WKP. So if you're interested in any th of that, and you haven't seen us before, uh, we're called Weave Works. Our website is weave.works, so please check us out. So today, a little bit of housekeeping. Like I said, we're very fortunate to have Brian from our team uh, speaking. Uh, if you haven't been to these Weave user groups before, uh, they can be as short as 30 minutes or uh, the maximum cutoff point is 60 minutes. So, but they're usually about 30 to 45 uh, with a presentation, Q&A. Uh, if you have burning questions and we go on, then we will extend, but we have a hard stop at 60 minutes. We're using a platform called Zoom, if you're not familiar with it. Um, the best way to ask questions uh, is to use the chat box. Hopefully you've been able to find the chat box. If not, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and you can see a little bit more functionality. You should be able to see a button on the top left corner of your screen. And a reminder, please make sure that uh, before you start chatting, make sure that your two uh, drop down is to everyone or to all panelists or all to attendees, depending on the uh, version you have uh, so that people can see your questions and sometimes people answer each other's questions. So make sure you do that so other people can see your answers. Um, I had one last thing I was going to mention. Oh, Brian, do you like 
getting questions throughout, or would you prefer that they come at the end? I think you're muted. So this is the way I'm going to answer all my questions, muted. Um, uh, yeah, at, at the end, I would think, unless unless someone's like really, really confused. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm hopefully there's a structure to the presentation um, and maybe something that you're unsure about early on will become clearer later. Okay, excellent. So we'll primarily do questions at the end, but if you really feel like you can't follow anymore, maybe put in the chat, confused, and then uh, I'll be alerted to let uh, Brian know that maybe we should pause to make sure that we're all on the same page. So hopefully that works. Hopefully you found your chat box. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brian. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Perfect. So you have my slide now. Um, so I'm uh, going to talk about automating Kubernetes with GitOps. So, uh, you know, we really don't know who shows up to these talks. So I'm going to assume a pretty low uh, base of knowledge. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about Kubernetes uh, and a lot about GitOps. Um, so yeah, I'm hopefully uh, not assuming that you're already an expert in any of these things. Um, so let me start uh, with myself. Uh, as um, Tamu said, I'm a director of engineering. That's my job title. Uh, there's a picture of me a bit younger. And I, this, I can see them both on the screen at the same time, so the difference is noticeable. Um, what I, the reason I put that, that screen up is from a GitHub, which um, maybe a lot of you have seen. Uh, and it, it just, just to indicate, I use Git a lot. Uh, that's where I'm coming from. I am a, a software developer. Um, I use GitOps because we came up with all this tooling for ourselves. Um, as Tamo said, we've, we've been running a production system on Kubernetes. Um, we built this stuff uh, not really to change the world, uh, but just to uh, automate and simplify what we were already doing. Um, but it kind of caught on. A lot of people are interested. Um, what else? In my background, I have worked in large organizations, banks typically. Um, so I'm going to cover, you know, some of how does how does the the GitOps idea work in that kind of a world as well. Um, okay, let's get moving. Um, so I thought I'd start with a quote from someone famous. Um, Kelsey Hightower is a, a great expert in uh, container world, Kubernetes, and so on. And and he said that uh, that GitOps is good. Um, yeah, he said version CI/CD on top of declarative infrastructure. Stop scripting and start shipping. So that's uh, that's the kind of positive message. And I'm going to hopefully explain uh, a bunch of these words. Um, background reading uh, that link at the bottom. Uh, weaveworx slash technologies slash GitOps. Um, we have a few resources on there. Uh, you know, fill in some of the background because uh, this is an overview. <laughs> Um, so let's get straight to it. Uh, here's the uh, one slide description of GitOps. What are we saying it means to do? Number one, des describe your entire system declaratively, and I'll get into what that means exactly. Version control, the desired state. So we have a description of what the system is supposed to be like. We have version control. Um, uh, state of the system through time and we apply changes to that desired state as version control commits so git commits if you're using git um, then we have some agents some software agents that sync things up uh, that automatically apply the desired state to the running system um, and if something goes wrong we, we we alert on that so that's it that is, that is what we are saying. We gave it a catchy name, GitOps. Um, but uh, that is the whole thing in a nutshell. Now, let me, let me kind of back out and walk through the pieces individually. Oh, actually, before I get to that, uh, I wanted to, to pose a thought. Um, we hear a lot about, about cloud native and the cloud transformation. Um, 
and you know huge difference when i when i worked in those enormous companies a few years back uh if you could get a, a new server in a month you you know that was that was pretty good really um maybe it would take longer if there was some kind of blockage um in the cloud two minutes you know we start getting impatient if uh, if our new server doesn't show up um in that kind of time so um so there's a massive transformation in in the terms of how the infrastructure can react. What about your software? Um, how long does it take to deliver a software change? And uh, and you know our, our our information, what we see talking to people, what we what we heard from uh, Forrester Research, uh, monthly or faster is in the minority. You know, people take months, people still take months to deliver software. So this is kind of why we're promoting GitOps as a, as a way to, um, to move faster and keep everything under very good control. Uh, so that's part of the motivation. Um, and this is just a kind of a thing for me to smile at. Uh, yeah, why does it take so long? Um, when there's a whole bunch of steps in your process and a whole bunch of different people to talk to each other. Um, so this is like, this is not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm gonna talk about GitOps, not this. Um, so why did Weaveworks as a company get um, started on this, really? Uh, well, what happened is one day, uh, years ago, uh, one day one of our engineers uh, managed to delete all of the servers in our production system all at once. And uh, obviously that, that took down our production system. Um, but we were back up and online and everything running uh, 40 minutes later. Um, and, that, and that included the time it took to go, oh heck. Um, or maybe we used other words. Um, so how was that possible? What exactly did we um, do to get back online? Uh, so we use declarative infrastructure. We have every part of our system described um, in files that state what it should look like. Um, all of those files are in Git on, on GitHub. Um, we use pull requests, uh, that's a kind of mechanism within GitHub to uh, allow people to see what you're doing and review it and approve it. Um, and we get alerts if, if the system diverges from that, uh, that source of truth in Git. So we, we already had that, this, this is like three and a half years ago now. Um, and and this, this thing of getting, getting back online after a total ac accidental outage, um, really inspired our CEO, Alexis Richardson, to, to drill into it and say, you know, what are you guys doing? Um, and, and then that kind of sparked the crusade. So that's, that's why Alexis invented the word GitOps, because uh, we, you know, we had the longer description. Um, so that's where it came from. That's, that's why he thought it was really cool. He thought everyone else should hear about it. And uh, here we are. Um, let's see, move the slide forward. There we go. Yeah. So anyone can use GitHub or any other Git, uh, you know, GitLab, Bitbucket, any any form of that that you like. Anyone can uh, ship the, the a new app within this world, make changes easily. All the changes are audited. Uh, they can be validated on the in the process around Git. Um, and it, and and none of this is actually particularly new. This is this is putting together pieces that already exist or existed. Um, a lot of people tell us that. They say, ah, I've been doing this for ages. And that, that's great, you know, we don't mind. Uh, the, the, uh, what we've done is, um, is given it a catchy name and created some tooling and, uh, you know, trying to spread the word. Um, okay, uh, did I see a question there? Is that important? Uh, Okay, well, I'll carry on if um, maybe uh, Tamil can check what the, what the question was that flashed up. Um, okay, so, so that was my anecdotes. Uh, let me get back to the, the description um, of what I'm 
the detail of what I'm talking about. Um, so let's get, get into Kubernetes and, and talk about declarative infrastructure. Um, so here's a picture of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, okay, now let me just check the chat. Uh, yeah, that, that's a question for the end. Okay. Um, so in my cluster, I have some, uh, some uh, computers, which Kubernetes calls nodes. Um, so so the, the, the big blocks is, is the whole cluster, uh, and I have computers in my cluster, um, and the, uh, the computers are going to run some software, uh, which is going to run in containers, and Kubernetes calls them pods. Or, or a little collection of containers is a pod. So that's this is a this is a, a picture of, in this case, three computers. Maybe you have more, um, running a bunch of different things in containers, which are collected into pods. And in the Kubernetes world, uh, we run a few more things. So we run um, a, a control plane, which uh, controls everything that's going on in the cluster. Um, and on each individual machine, we run a, a few more uh, Kubernetes uh, daemons. Um, and the basic idea is that you put, a, you put a description of what you would like uh, the state of the system to be into the control plane. Um, Kubernetes will uh, send that information to an individual node. Um, and the node, oops, what happened there? Yeah, the node will... Um, that's spoil my joke. Uh, the node will um, make that particular software run or configure it with a particular number of replicas. Um, uh, the pattern is that, that you, you um, make a request to the control plane stating declaring, as in declarative, that's what we mean. You declare what you would like the system to be um, so I want to run this software, this software, this software. I want 10 replicas of this one, one of those, three of those. Um, all the different things that I want in my cluster are expressed uh, to Kubernetes um, in YAML, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and, um, and then the, the Kubernetes system takes care of allocating that software to the machines that it's going to run on, uh, firing up the software, watching to see if it dies, a whole bunch of things like that. Um, but the, uh, the big thing that I wanted to get across is this idea that, that at the center of it, there is a description of what you want to be running. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look at some YAML. It's not going to be much. Um, uh, YAML is just a file format. Uh, and um, and this is generally how we uh, tell Kubernetes what we want. Um, so this is one file. Uh, this is kind of what YAML looks like. It's kind of indented across the page, and and uh, we have some some thing colon thing. So this is like a the the field that we're specifying, and this is the value. Um, so this thing as a whole is a request for Kubernetes to run a deployment, um, so to deploy some software. Uh, it's gonna be called my deployment. It's gonna run two replicas, so maybe for failover. And it's gonna run a container called web server, which is running the Nginx software. Um, so I'm not here to kind of explain all the details of, uh, of how Kubernetes works today, but, but the basic idea is that you can describe everything you want to run in your cluster, um, whether it's on, uh, on three computers or on 3,000, um, in a set of files that is pretty much like this. And uh, you can request changes to what's running by changing what's in the file. So you can change the number of replicas. You can change the version of the software. You can specify a whole bunch of other parameters. Um, that would, would make this file bigger. That is the basic idea of uh, declarative infrastructure, writing down the way the world should be, putting it in a file, um, and then giving that file to, to in this case, Kubernetes um, to run. Okay. 
Um, why not put it in a database? I mean, another anecdote from my history. This is actually a picture of a trading floor I, I used to run all the, the software on. Um, and uh, uh, we, we did that. We rolled everything out automatically. We, we controlled everything that was running um, in a um, multi-billion pound trading desk um, in a database. The problem that we haven't thought of is that... Uh, at any point in time, when you look in the database, you see one version of the state and, and you say, well, why, why is it that version? Why is it exactly that way? How did we get here? And you, you don't have the history. So, um, so that's what's so great about doing it in Git. Um, Git has the history. Uh, so this is a, um, what I'm putting on the screen here is actually one of our, uh, the history of one of our um, deployment files. Um, we happen to use GitHub. Uh, this is our staging cluster. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is exactly how we control it. So like, you know, updating the version, raising the memory limit, um, bunch of changes like that. Uh, and it happens to be me that changed this file. Um, but with well, a whole bunch of people on the team putting in, uh, commits into the data, into the, the Git repo. Um, so, uh, so yeah, putting it in a database uh, is really cool and really powerful. Putting it in Git is way better because you have the history. You have a, a list of exactly who did what when. So let's uh, look a little deeper, deeper at that. Look at the process walkthrough. Um, so the basic idea is uh, we're going to have a Git repo with all those files in it, um, specifying what, what should be running. Uh, we're going to synchronize that up to Kubernetes. Now, um, this could be anything. Uh, we happen to have written a tool um, called Flux, which is the GitOps operator for Kubernetes. Uh, that, that tool is now, as Tamo mentioned earlier, in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, so, uh, you know, we created it, but we, we now do not own um, the, the intellectual property. It's open source. Uh, we gave it away so everyone could contribute and share and not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, it's not hugely complicated. I mean, it kind of sounds like something you could do in a bash script in, in 10 lines. But, um, you know, if that's, if that's your concern, then take a look at the, the, the software. It's a bit bigger than that. Um, and uh, it, basically, there's a bunch of corner cases and a bunch of extra things that people sometimes want to do. So, um, so yeah, it's it's there. You know, we're uh, not here to sell that. Uh, we gave it away free, uh, so everyone could could benefit. Um, but that's the the core of what we use. Uh, it doesn't matter what exactly goes in this box. The fundamental principle of GitOps is you have the definition of the way the world should be over here, uh, version controlled, uh, and you sync it up to what is actually running. Now, um, so here's a person. Uh, person is going to make a change. Uh, that goes in as a git commit. Um, that gets synced up, goes into the cluster. Very simple. Uh, suppose we changed the version of the software then Kubernetes is going to pull um, the new, ver the, the new uh, container image. It's going to pull that down. From, you know, this could be Docker Hub or uh, uh, Google Container Registry, some, something like that, um, where your software is hosted. It could be private repo. Uh, all of this stuff can be hosted uh, on-premise, by the way. Um, we're big into the cloud, but, but you don't have to be. Uh, so, yeah, so if this is a change that, needs a new version of the software, that'll come down from your image repository that way. Um, so building on, on that idea, what, what happens if we're running a, um, uh, a continuous integration pipeline, if we're building new software, you know, if we have a bunch of developers building new software all the time? Um, what's going to happen in them, this case is, is they're going to have uh, probably a different repo. Um, this is something a lot of people ask about. Um, uh, so basically, there's 
very unlikely to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, bits of software that you're building and places where you're running that software. So to me, it makes sense to, to separate those things, to put, put the code in its own repo or maybe in multiple repos, maybe some of these are third party, doesn't matter. Um, and to, to put the config for your system uh, in a different repo, so you can control that separately at its own pace. And you can bring together maybe multiple things. Um, so yeah, here's a developer now making a code change. Um, so that's gonna go through the uh, build pipeline. Uh, and we don't care what you use for that. You know, that can be Jenkins, that can be Circle CI, it can be anything you like, um, your own bash script. Uh, that's gonna, the output of that, you know, hopefully you have a bunch of tests and things like that. When this is past all of its tests, you're gonna get a new image in the uh, container image repository. Um, and another feature of Flux is that we can automatically uh, push that through um, to the config repo. So we, we uh, spot, uh, maybe through a webhook or, or just by pulling it, um, we spot that a change has arrived. Uh, we can automatically push a commit if you want that. So, this, so what we do is in our staging environment, we automatically push updates straight out of CI into CD. So that's continuous integration at the top, continuous deployment, CI, CD. Um, and we put it, we do this in our staging uh, environment. We, we do something a little bit different for production. We have a, uh, we have a human authorize those changes um, and uh, decide when they're going to be pushed into production. So you can do either or neither, or, you know, that's one of the reasons why Flux is a little bit bigger than a 10 line script. Um, you can, you can control, uh, you can use it in um, a dozen different ways, exactly how you want to set it up in your system. Um, and you can apply processes, uh, any process you like around these changes. So that could be a pull request, a PR process, could be an authorization process, a sign off process. Um, there's a bunch of tools that can do that. Uh, all that we really care about is when the final commit hits um, the uh, whatever the branch is that you're using for your particular uh, environment, that's the one we're going to sync up. If you make a mistake, um, undo the commit, uh, well, which is a new commit in, in the Git world. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to, um, to do that and, and we'll just sync that up. That's, uh, that's how it all works in this GitOps world. Um, now the thing we very often hear, uh, just, just drive deployment from CI. Um, so like I say, generally uh, what you're deploying to is gonna run code from more than one source code repo. Um, so you're gonna have like a pretty complicated setup with, with multiple different CI pipelines deploying into one uh, target. Um, and as I put on the previous page, sometimes or, or very often you're deploying the same code to multiple environments. Um, so uh, by separating the two concerns, by saying this is continuous integration, all we do is we, we run builds, we run tests, we produce images, and this is continuous deployment, this piece is GitOps, all we do is make changes to config and sync those up to uh, the running system. Um, that greatly simplifies the whole uh, question of, of how do we do deployment. Um, it makes it uh, makes it much more resilient. So things can go wrong, right, when you're deploying. If you do the deployment off the end of your build pipeline and you manage, you've got to deploy like five things, you get three of them done and then something goes wrong. Um, that's a pretty thorny situation to get yourself out, to, out of. Uh, in, the, in the GitOps world, if we run a, a sync and, and uh, three things work and, and two of them go wrong. Um, what's going to happen is we're going to sync that up again a couple of minutes later. And hopefully, hopefully that was a glitch that'll work this time. Maybe there's something wrong in the config. Fix that. It'll sync up. We have all the history. We can see what happened. Um, we don't have to figure out how to rerun 
the last two fifths of one step of our build pipeline in the heat of the moment when production is done. So uh, separate those two concerns. That's what we say. Um, uh, continuous integration, a lot of tools to do that. We're not really uh, changing the way that works, but do do continuous deployment separately and we suggest GitOps. So that was that slide. Um, let me see. Uh, so bigger picture, um, this is the kind of process. We have our desired state in Git. We sync that up to the configured state. Um, and the next thing you want to do is observe. Uh, so in other words, you want to have monitoring, maybe tracing, maybe logs. Um, and that turns into a cycle. Uh, so you, you make a change, you observe that, you, you um, release, observe, operate your control system, which involves people. It's going to make changes to Git, going to change the, the runtime system. This is the GitOps automatic sync up. Um, so this is kind of the, the bigger picture. Uh, you know, what do we recommend? How do you run your lives uh, in terms of operating systems? Um, just kind of stepping out and, and GitOps kind of uh, lives in this piece. Um, our, well, yeah, our, we, have, we have a whole suite of tools that kind of cover that whole picture. Um, just to touch on one of them, a uh, thing called Flagger. Um, Flagger is concerned with doing things like canary deployments. Uh, progressive deployments where you don't just say deploy the software and it's all done. Um, we uh, with Flagger we can do it this way. So we have like several instances of version one running. Um, we bring along version two and we divert five percent of the traffic to version two. And then we we observe. Flagger does this automatically. It will watch your metrics and make sure that's okay. It'll then ramp up that percentage while things are okay. Um, it'll it'll ramp up the new uh, version of the software. Um, if everything is still okay, it'll uh, uh, carry on um, scale the uh, the uh, version one uh, down to zero, uh, and then we only have version two. Uh, but if something goes wrong, it'll it'll roll it back. Uh, so you, so you can have uh, if you have metrics that tell you whether your system is healthy or not, whether you're getting a like a high rate of errors. Um, that's what Flagger does automatically uh, controlling um, uh, canary. This is what what I've drawn here is a canary rollout. So that's uh, that's another kind of part of the picture. Um, we can we we do in fact uh, GitOps Kubernetes itself. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, well, if this is your Kubernetes cluster, um, you can have uh, a specification for the cluster, um, and that can live in Git. So we have a we have a particular format which is defined by the the, the Kubernetes project. Um, in what's called seed cluster lifecycle, which we're we've worked heavily involved in, um, you have a, a different kind of daemon, uh, a different kind of thing syncing up um, to Kubernetes. But um, all of the all of the pieces, like the upgrades to the Kubernetes software itself, um, the, uh, the 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 even the number of nodes, anything like that, can be controlled and uh, updated. Um, in a GitOps fashion. Uh, so we started out, um, you, can, you can read some of our blog posts about this, we started out uh, creating the machines using Terraform, installing the Kubernetes software using Ansible, um, and controlling all of that from Git repo. Um, nowadays we have, a, we have a product uh, which Tamo mentioned, uh, the, the WeaveWorks Kubernetes platform, uh, which integrates this all together and, and um, doesn't rely on those tools. But uh, uh, yeah, that's that's that basic idea. So yeah, cunning subliminal advert, it says. Um, this is our product suite, including all of these things. The um, open source tools that I've mentioned, um, Flux, which is the GitOps operator. It's what I focused on most of the time. 
um, uh, that's the thing doing that sync up operation between your, your Git repo and your Kubernetes cluster. If you use Helm uh, within the same project, the Helm operator, um, so we can do the same thing in, at a Helm level. And then I mentioned the Flagger tool, which does uh, Canary deployments. So all of these tools are open source. You can find them at these URLs at the bottom of the screen. And um, you know, please try them out. Please make them better. Um, anyway, I think I come to the end of my slides. Uh, well, yeah, let's just put up this one again. That's what I said at the beginning. This is what GitOps means. Um, describe your entire system declaratively. Version control the desired state. Apply changes to the desired state as version control commits, and have software agents that sync that up or alert and or alert on divergence. Okay, uh, I think I'll leave that up and uh, we'll throw it open to questions. I think we had at least one question already. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you came in late, please use the chat box uh, and send to all panelists and attendees. Um, we had a question uh, earlier um, I think you probably answered it, but might as well cover again. Um, where do you store your credentials in a GitOps method? Yeah, I did not. Uh, I did not answer that. Oh. Um, uh, so yeah, this um, uh, there's there's kind of uh, two or three uh, possible answers to this question. Um, the one uh, one obvious answer is um, put them in the Git repo. Um, the danger with that is everyone who has access to the, that Git repo has your credentials. Um, so, uh, you know, that might, uh, might work if, if you're, um, pretty happy with how you control access to that Git repo and, and, um, uh, not that concerned about the people who have access to it. Um, uh, another possible answer is to use what's called the sealed secrets technique. So basically we encrypt, uh, we take the secrets, uh, we do put them in the Git repo, but we encrypt them. And then there's one more secret, which is the decryption key. Um, and that gets placed into the cluster separately. Um, and that uh, unseals the, uh, the secrets. Um, so that's, that's kind of a bit better because it, you know, it's not everyone who has access to the repo that now has your credentials. It's just the people who have access to the repo and the one extra secret. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, credentials. Um, so, so again, I'll talk about what we do in terms of running Weave Cloud. We run on AWS. All the crucial credentials are Amazon uh, roles, IAM. In, in that world, the, the um, Amazon Access Management System. Um, and, and so we actually automatically uh, assign roles to pods in Kubernetes uh, using a tool called uh, Kiam, K I A M. Um, same principle is, is certainly doable on uh, Google Cloud and, and presumably on many other clouds. Um, so that's uh, that's a third way to do it is, is actually have zero credentials within um, uh, within the configuration of your system and uh, components of your system pick up rights to do what they got to do um, by communicating with something else, which sort of grants them short-lived tokens. Um, probably something like a like a HashiCorp Vault uh, would also work in that uh, in that sort of way. Uh, so yeah, big, big, long answer. That's why I saved it till afterwards. Um, you do have to be careful with, with credentials, uh, but there's a few different ways to do it that you can pick from. Excellent. Um, we have another great question. Um, so how much of this that you've talked about comes out of the box with flux or, um, our hosted flux called weave cloud and how much has to be actually configured and glued together? Um, right. So, uh, so the, the, so what Flux will do is it will sync up, um, uh, from a Git repo to a, a Kubernetes cluster. 
um, and it will also populate an initial version of a, a Git repo if, if you didn't do that already. Um, it's all uh, command line based, the, the open source tool. So the, uh, the Weave Cloud commercial product uh, puts a really nice GUI on top of that and you just kind of click on stuff and point it at your repo, your Git repo. Um, you get kind of the monitoring charts and you can see what's happening. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a little hard to describe maybe. The, I mean, the, you know, what you, if you have, if you have a running Kubernetes cluster, uh, then you can go from there to GitOps controlling it in a couple of steps. Um, and that is all in the box. The, the, the big noticeable difference between what's in the open source tool is it's command line driven. What's in the commercial product, it's, um, uh, it's got a nice GUI and we integrate things like uh, who's allowed to do what and, and um, uh, you know, the, the, um, it's all browser based, so you can kind of share stuff around your team. Um, yeah, Flux has, Flux has no concept of who's allowed to do what. So it's, it's sort of at the Kubernetes level, um, if you, uh, oh, and, and at the Git level, you know, if you have, if you have access to the Git repo, um, then you can make a commit and that's going to uh, change what's running. Flux itself is subject to access controls on Kubernetes. So for instance, RBAC, role-based access control. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so there's no concept of like user identities and permissions and things within Flux, but uh, you are relying on a Git repo, which itself can have that concept. Um, and you're relying on Kubernetes, which again has that concept. So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm finding it a little hard to, to kind of itemize the what's in the box question, but uh, uh, take a look, try it out. A lot of, lot of stuff on, uh, on the repo and in the docs and um, many thousands of people using this software. So uh, it's not impossible to get, just try it out, get going. I should also mention that, um, so August 28th next week, uh, we're doing our celebratory talk with the people who are the core contributors and maintainers of Flux, because uh, we have just joined the CNCF. So uh, maybe they can go into a different angle or have a different experience around that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question. Do you test or validate your YAML files or configs? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, uh, so, uh, we do, and in uh, in WeaveWorks, uh, we ha as part of our um, uh, controls around the our configuration repo, we we have a whole suite of um, tools that that kind of analyze things for consistency and and um, uh, you know valid YAML and and we we have a, we have a set of checklists like you you're not allowed to put a service into production without having a dashboard and alerts and things like that. Um, we have not productized, well, that, that's certainly that's not part of the open source uh, product. It is available as, as part of the uh, Weave Kubernetes um, platform. So uh, uh, what will happen if, um, you know, at the, at the basic level, uh, Kubernetes will validate uh, your YAML and will object to you know, either completely malformed files or files that make certain changes that are disallowed, and that will show up as an error from Flux. Um, so it's validated uh, in in the base uh, open source tool. It's validated by Kubernetes. Um, uh, it's certainly possible, and and I think part of the spirit of the thing to to run uh, uh, many more checks. Um, but uh, th that is that is kind of at an enterprise level in our product suite at the moment. Cool. Uh, can you compare contrast a little bit, um, sort of our GitOps with how one might do GitOps with Jenkins X? Mm. No. <laughs> okay. I I looked at Jenkins once, or maybe maybe twice, maybe like once fifteen years ago and once two years ago. Uh, and I've never looked at Jenkins X. Sorry. Um, 
maybe we um, we definitely do have a, a friend over that team who's given talks, actually, including like our um, technology, like Flagger. So maybe we can see if you can be come come over and be a guest. Um, so another question. Going back to your CI/CD slide, if you want to go back to that, uh, how do you automatically sync? Uh, the staging folder with the production folder, or is there a tool for that? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, uh, there's no out of the box tool for that. We again, uh, we we have that stuff. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I guess for us, it's very. Uh, uh, and, and probably for, for most people, it, it, it's quite case specific. So you kind of know that there are some things that are supposed to be running in staging and not in production and some things that are supposed to be running in production and not staging and some things that are supposed to be um, many replicas in production and only one replica in stage. You know, there's a whole bunch of differences that are supposed to be there. Um, and uh, uh, so what we do have in, um, uh, in Flux and in Weave Cloud is, is the idea of a, a promotion deployment. So you can, you can take the versions of what's running in staging and you can take those versions of, you know, of one thing or a whole suite of things and, and put them across to production in one commit. Um, so we have that idea that, that you promote uh, from staging to production exactly what you're running in the staging environment is what you're now going to be running in the production environment. Um, so that, that exists. Uh, checks are not um, built in the, the open source tooling. We, we, we have built some checks in our own environment, but like I say, they're very kind of situation dependent and it's kind of difficult to, um, difficult to see how that could be a, a thing that we ship out to tens of thousands of people. Uh, is the manual approval for deploying to production? Well, it's it's Git, right? The the approval in our case is a PR um, approval on on GitHub. Uh, so yeah, manual man, man, it would never be impl implemented in Flux. It's it's in Git. It's a it's approving a change being merged to a Git branch, uh, and there's a bunch of ways to do that. So um, pick one. Um. So sort of a follow-up is just maybe more broadly, um, what are other tech technologies that we can use other than Kubernetes to do GitOps or is? Yeah, um, well, like I say, uh, we, we started out uh, doing the, creating the machines themselves uh, with, with Terraform. Um, uh, that actually is exactly how we managed to delete the entire production system all at once. Uh, so um, do be careful. Uh, the uh, so the machine level at t with using Terraform, putting the, the Terraform state file in Git, um, uh, or uh, or the actually the state file is the output. Anyway, it, it's it's doable. We have a blog post about that. Um, same thing with Ansible, uh, you know, you can basically run all these things in a loop and, and run them in their checking mode. Um, so we, we, we backed off from automatically syncing um, those things because it is quite dangerous, but, but you, can, you can do the next best thing, which is kind of, you have a Git-based definition of what's supposed to be running and you, you alert if it diverges from um, what's actually running. Um, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, basically any any tooling that has that nature of being declarative, like like what's what's what you can put something in a file that says how things are supposed to be, and and the the the, the big different way of doing it, the thing that's not declarative is imperative, where you say do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, so if if it, if your tooling works that way, you can't really put that, or you can put that in Git, but you know what happens if something goes wrong? you can't necessarily just run it again. Um, so, uh, so that's the big thing, it has to be declarative. So, so any tool, uh, Kubernetes is one, Ansible is one, Terraform is one, there's a bunch of others. Um, 
any tool which works on the basis that you say how things are supposed to be and then you run something to kind of sync it up, um, that's going to work at least somewhat with, with the GitOps philosophy. Um, and, and tools where you kind of write instructions uh, are, are really not um, because you can't, you can't kind of sync it up again. You can't resync it uh, if you got halfway through. All right, last question. Um, does our WeWorks Kubernetes platform integrate with the Kubernetes service catalog? Mm. I'm not so sure. uh, no, is, is the simple answer. I'd be, I'd be interested, maybe you could write us an email or something about, about you know, what your thinking is on that, what, what you see as the benefits, what you'd love to get out of that. Um, uh, yeah, so, so no, there's no, um, there's no direct integration with the service catalog right now. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, hopefully, can you guys see my slide? I can see one that talks about a new talk. Okay, great. So um, if this is your first time, as I mentioned, this is our Weave online user group. We have tons of tons of events uh, on our calendar. Mostly we meet on Tuesdays at this time, um, but sometimes we have some special ones like here. We have the flux into the CNCF. Um, we have uh, one with uh, Aspen Mesh coming up. So we actually are pretty chock full uh, in the coming week. Uh, and after that, we've got uh, more in September, including one on EKS and EKS Cuddle. So um, yes, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll be following up with an email with my email on it or Marketing will be doing that with my email address on it. So feel free to reach out to me. If you want to hear more about GitOps, um, we do have this um, ebook. Uh, of course, any questions, Brian's there, I'm there, come to our Slack channel. And if you're interested in any of our future events, this uh, meetup.com uh, link is our single source of truth. It's our best place to find our latest calendar. So with that, thank you so much for joining and all your great questions. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.